Um, everybody, a round of applause for Justin Snake. So, what a great conference so far. This has been amazing. Yeah. You know, we saw a lot of talks about people bringing things into production, uh, how to be able to prepare for that, how to be able to prepare for disaster, how to be able to make sure that you can scale things. We've had talks that covered all aspects of it, from just intense, mind-blowing topics to just, you know, getting up and running. And what a, a wide variety to be able to cover. And so I'm here to be able to talk about uh, a little bit of the hardware end of this stuff. And we're going to look a little bit about the NURBS project and things like that, too. But when asked to speak, I was sort of presented with the topic, production. And it got me thinking a lot about production over the months, like preparing. And it, it got me thinking about, uh, specifically, what does it mean to be production ready? You know, because we all talk about putting things into production. But when do you know that it's the time to do that? And it's, and it's usually always said, like, oh, is it production ready? Is it production ready? And, and the definition of that has become extremely vague, I feel like, because it's, it's like nobody ever really defines what production is anymore and, uh, and how to be able to, like, when the time is necessary to be able to actually get it there. And so while sort of considering what that means to me, I, I took a look back at the years uh, of becoming a computer programmer and an engineer, and sort of like a little tale I want to tell of my path towards getting there. And, and we're going to like travel back in time a little bit and see where the world has come from uh, in the early times of what it actually uh, was to have to harden something for it to be production ready. And so I, like most of you here, am an engineer. And I think that as engineers, we absolutely see this world in a different way. Whenever we go out and interact with other people or devices or even just uh, you know, going through doors and traveling down the streets, you know, I, I feel like we're always sort of looking for problems to solve and how we can come up with new innovative ways to be able to make it easier to get from you know, here to the next street down? Uh, what kind of hacks can we do to be able to find faster routes? And you know, like maybe if that door is stuck there, like how can we fix that door a little bit so that it doesn't squeak when it opens? We sort of have this mindset where uh, when, we, when we live our lives as engineers, we see things using principles of we observe our surroundings. We come up with a theory on how we can fix it. And then we'll be like, OK, let me put a little WD-40 in there. And then we test it. We analyze the results. And if we're happy, then we're good to go. We break out of this cycle. We can go on to the next problem. So everywhere we go, we're applying this scientific method. I mean, it doesn't stop for me even in like physical worlds, like working with this stuff. I just, sometimes it just it stays in your head while you're sleeping even, too. And so living life like this, uh, the f I can, I'm, I'm sort of like remembering back what my first experiences were of like what it was to be an engineer. And the, the first time that I've ever experienced this, I was in elementary school when we learned about uh, climate and the weather and specifically about something called cloud seeding. And it was like really interesting when I heard about cloud seeding. Now I'm from the northeast of the United States, so we get uh, some snow periodically, and, and snow has this wonderful effect for children that it causes schools to get closed. <laughs> and so I see snow causing the school to get closed, and the day off where I can go out and play with my friends, and I learn about cloud seeding, cloud seeding being the concept where you can sort of uh, coax weather into doing what you want to do, for example, getting it to snow, by uh, introducing uh, particles, such as like salt, into the cloud. And the salt gives this super cooled uh, uh, cloud the ability for the water molecules, something to bond onto and start to form snowflakes. And that would cause the cloud to start snowing. I was fascinated by this. I mean, 
who, what kid wouldn't want to control the weather so that they can have their friends go out? So what did I do? Well, I formed a hypothesis. I thought to myself, you know, if I could get some salt up in those clouds, then I can, I can uh, 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 cause it to start snowing and, I, and everything will be great. So I went out and I bought an RC uh, plane. Step one. <laughs> Step two, strap a box of salt to that RC plane. <laughs> yep. Step three, fly it into some clouds. <laughs> Step four, snow. <laughs> Step five, mm, winning. <laughs> At least this was my plan. And, you know, the plan at this point, I'm young. It's my first experience is doing engineering work. This plan kind of failed. Uh, see, what happens when you put a box of salt on top of an RC airplane that wasn't designed to carry uh, is that it usually becomes less aerodynamic let alone the fact that I would have needed a lot of salt to be able to get into those clouds. And also, I sort of skipped over a crucial step here, and this is a learning experience because, uh, you know, uh, when you go to fly an RC airplane, it helps if you practice flying first, instead of just being like, I bought a plane, put box of salt on it, fly it into the clouds, how am I gonna land it? Yeah, it crashed. So, not, not successful in this case. But, I was sort of, at that point, I didn't give up. It wasn't like a, a bummer situation. You know, as engineers, we get into the end of this loop where we learn something and we're like, okay, uh, that wasn't really that depressing, but I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm like addicted to the idea that, that I, I, I did this test and I got results. The results weren't what I wanted, but I got results. So a few years go by and now I'm sort of in like junior high and as most junior high school kids do, you hang out in your room a lot. And, uh, and the problem comes like, you know, your parents are downstairs, they want you to do something, and uh, they'll, they'll ask you, they'll be like, hey, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, nothing. And they're like, what? And then you gotta walk downstairs and like, have, like be like, I wasn't doing anything. And then you go back upstairs, and it's just a whole mess. I didn't wanna have to deal with that whole back and forth. So plan, next plan, I wanted to build an intercom system. And this was, this was now my goal. I, a little switch on either box, wired, nothing too fancy. And you flip one of the switches, you can talk to the other unit, you turn that one off, the other unit can flip their switch, they can talk back to you, and, uh, and everything was good. Now, I didn't want to make the same mistakes that I made last time. Uh, I realized that in order to be able to accomplish this goal, I would have to do a little bit more research. I would have to first understand some of the principles of this uh, to build myself up. I wasn't just going to go out and be like, oh, here's a box of parts. It's an intercom, I think. Instead, you've got to be able to take it one step at a time. And I realized with this first drip of hardware experience now of going, okay, what do I need to know? Basic electronics. What's a perf board? What do I do with it? What's a resistor? Well, that, the questions of those then lead into, how do I read a schematic? Because I was lucky enough to be able to be uh, guided by somebody who at least had some of this knowledge. They gave me a schematic for, the, uh, for how to assemble the parts for an intercom system, but you know, not really any of the know-how. That was still up to me to be able to do. And now I'm understanding how to do schematics. I'm like, okay, now I need to be able to solder this stuff together. And and throughout this, it was like, it, was, it became apparent, I was successful, by the way, in this case, but it became apparent that in order to be able to work with hardware, it was sort of this, that, that cycle where, where you're just kind of like, okay, let me come up with a theory, and let me try to be able to put it together, and then let me try to be able to get to the point where I feel satisfaction, because I got results. It took a long time to get there. And, and even though I was eventually successful, I was left with the notion at that time that working with hardware was hard. And the satisfaction that I was getting, it was delayed. Now during this time, computing, like general computing started coming around. My first computer I had was a Commodore 64, right? So that was where I sort of got introduced to programming a little bit, because in order to use that computer, you have to know how to do some programming. And then from there, I ended up uh, 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 still having this urge to want to be able to, to work on hardware, you know? Uh, I satisfied that urge at the same time that I sort of married it together with computing by being able to build my first tower, like a, 
it was like a 286 or something I made. It was 286 or a 386. And that was great, because back then, when, when those kinds of computers were starting to come out, the only way to be able to, uh, to, to like get something up and running was like, you're in, the, in there, you're like putting new components in, you're like, oh, let me upgrade it, because it's actually upgradable. Let me put like this new drive in, let me put a new drive space in, and then all of a sudden things just started like taking off. I'm still satisfied because I get to tinker with hardware, but I'm moving forward with software. Wonderful things like Prodigy comes out and dial-up modems. And we start getting connected together with other people, bulletin boards. And we're starting to see like this transition where stuff's just starting to take off and move forward and get faster. And that cycle then continues with America Online and America Online and America Online and so many hours for free. <laughs> Who has time to work with hardware anymore? <laughs> so now here we are at this point. Everybody's connected to the internet, and this sort of becomes the central point of our worlds, where we're like, you know what, we don't need to like, deal with these physical items. We can build these digital empires. And what we constructed were these cities, these virtual places that people could build giant products on top of. And, and then what happens is, because the competition becomes so fierce in this case, it's so easy to be able to just sit down at this, at this, this window that we have to this, to this virtual world. You know, what, it, what happens is we get to the point now where we're just like, okay, I need to put something in production. Okay, I'm going to program. Does it work? Yeah, good. Ship it. Okay, I'm going to write some more. Okay, does that work? Good. Ship it. Does this, does this work? Okay, is that good. Ship it. <laughs> you know, so here we are now, like, like from the beginning. Trying to build an intercom system, production ready at that point had a different meaning. What does it mean to be production ready? You know, then it was like, in order for it to be production ready, it had to, it had to be hardened and make sure that all the components were in the right place and everything was good before I could put it on the wall. Putting it on the wall and testing it and making sure it worked, that was production. And that took a long time. But with this digital empire that we have, what it means to be production ready is, I don't call, just put it out there. Can I unit test it? Can I A-B test with it? Can I do continuous deployment and property tests with it? I mean, it kind of became a joke. <laughs> like, legitimately, web programming these days has accelerated the speed at which we can receive that satisfaction, that just drip of write some code, does it work? Ooh, yeah. Put it in production. And because that cycle has increased so fast and so rapid, it's sort of skewed our minds when it comes to what we think about with production ready. This, this feedback loop, the reason that we have this satisfaction is because when we hit the analyze results part, if it fails in production, that failure isn't really failure. That's just learning. And the faster we can fail, the faster and more we can learn. And the more we learn as engineers, I mean, the more driven we are to just keep learning. So the cycle has been increased so quickly. And I think that the reason for this is because as we start to lower the amount of distribution that we have in our systems, in other words, if I were to sell intercom systems, I would have to sell them as individual units. And production ready has a higher impact then because they'd be installed in people's homes. And if there was a problem, it would cost me a lot of money to fix that problem for everyone. SaaS software turned this model on its head. We removed the amount of distribution that we're putting out there to centralize the place that we can control so we can actually load things in production 25 times a day and that increases our iteration time drastically. So here's our perspective. We're caught up to real life. What we do as engineers now, be able to get that satisfaction. You know, I'm a lot older and I'm, lot, I'm, I'm working in web software at this time. I'm just sitting down at these digital cities, these terminals. And, and then what happens is you can see my picture of hardware here, computer hardware, changes. Now we have these laptops and phones that if you want to upgrade them, you can't. 
So here what I'm left with is my satisfaction I was receiving from being able to swap components out is gone. And I got to start getting that itch again to be able to work on hardware. Now, I remember from past experiences how difficult that was, but I thought I'd take another look because I had some ideas. And with hardware lagging behind software going at this fast rate, it seems like things are starting to catch up, especially when it comes to prototyping. So when I go and look back, rapid prototyping-wise, now we have tools like Arduino and Raspberry Pi. And if you're unfamiliar with these, the Arduino is the one on the left that's a microcontroller, and it does real-time processing in a loop. And the, uh, uh, those are usually programmed in like C or C++. There's no operating system. There's no like shared memory and all that kind of stuff. And the, the unit on the right, that's a Raspberry Pi. Uh, that does have an OS that runs Linux. And uh, it has a full like, package to it. You know, you can install full-on Linux. And at this point, I'm not really versed in that. So I start with the easy route, the Arduino. What do I want to do? Well, the first project that I choose to do in this new realm, I'm going to build a remote starter for my motorcycle. I did it with Arduinos to be able to get started. Uh, integrated uh, wearable uh, system into the jacket and the motorcycle itself. Um, the lesson that I learned here was not uh, really how to be able to do it, but how to uh, actually just hotwire a bike. <laughs> <laughs> Because the questions you ask yourself are like, okay, what do I have to do to start a bike? I gotta put the key in, I gotta turn the ignition, and then I gotta like hit the start run, switch to run, and then like push the starter button. And I'm like, what are those things? Well, those things are just like switches. So what do I need to do to automate a switch? Well, that's a relay. So how do I automate a bunch of relays? And what is a relay? A relay is basically you going like this with wires. <laughs> And then I remember the first time I took this thing out to, to do a test drive. It was like 3 in the morning. I'm, su I'm just super surprised I got it up and running. I'm going and driving down the street, and then I get to a stoplight, and I look down. I realize I don't need the key in the ignition, so it's not there. What would this look like if I got pulled over? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the learning experience from this project was that it uncovered a whole new realm of pro uh, like problems with connectivity. The Arduino platform was great because it helped get things up and running quickly. There was a lot of tutorials out there on how to be able to do easy things, like control relays. If you ask the right questions, you'll be able to usually find the right answers, and if you match up enough of the right answers, you can build more of a complex system, and you can do things like this in a fairly straightforward way. Unfortunately, where it dropped the ball was, now I've got my motorcycle remote starting, how do I uplink some of the data to, my, to like the internet? And that's where it fell short. Arduino is nice for the small, local, low-level stuff. But once you start having to do things like TCP and secure SSL communication, it doesn't have enough like, space on it to be able to do that, let alone uh, like, you have to provide a lot of that. You have to write a lot of that boilerplate for you. And right around this time is when I, I realized it's, it's just too hard to be able to do this stuff with the tools today. There has to be a better way. And so I decided that I would start working on NERVS project to be able to make it easier for people to create and build embedded devices using more advanced computer systems like Raspberry Pis and uh, of that sort. So I worked together on NERVS project with, uh, I'm the co-author with uh, Frank Hunleth. Um, and uh, uh, together we build this a uh, kit to be able to help people demystify that, it, that, that which is hardware, you know, that like mystical thing that we don't want to really go towards because it feels hard. But the reality of it is, what does NERVS Project do for you when it comes to hardware? Well, I mean, we do the same thing you do for web pro programming. You take your Elixir application, we create an OTP release out of that, and then we just, instead of putting it onto a web server, we put it onto an embedded device. To do this, we introduced a couple extra mix commands, like mix firmware and mix, and mix burn. Um, when you produce, you take your OTP release, that process we call making, it's making firmware. That firmware is immutable to run on the device in the runtime for your application. And then you use the mix burn command after you put your SD card in to be able to burn it. And so what does that look like? Well, the SD card you can kind of consider at that point just to be like a removable hard drive. 
You know, these Raspberry Pi devi uh, devices boot off these SD cards. These SD cards are essentially their hard disk. And when you put the hard disk into your computer, you're expanding the file system that you want onto it. So here's what a typical Raspberry Pi NERVS file system looks like. We have uh, some provisioning information at the top, the blue box. Those are read-only. That's basically where the bootloader and uh, the get, like, everything getting started and information about the board, like its serial number, are stored. And then you'll notice that we have matching sets of boot and root file system partitions. And that's because out of the box, uh, uh, NERVS devices will essentially do a blue-green deployment strategy on themselves. We have two slots so that for the boot part, that's where the Linux kernel would go and the bootloader actual code, and then the root file system, that's going to be like you would for your server root file system, just for your device. If you're booted off of A and a new firmware update comes in, you stream it, it streams it into the B slot, and then you can do some validation checks on it to make sure that it's going to work and that's not going to brick your device. And then when it's good, you can boot into that. And you'll always have a last known good working place to be able to revert back to if you needed to. And then at the bottom, we have the application data partition. And the reason that we have that in a different color is because that's the place where you can do your read and write. If you need to be able to persist some state between uh, firmware, uh, like uh, data, like SQLite databases or files or whatever, uh, that's where you can uh, store that information. And the beauty of this system, being that it's immutable, means that when you power it off and power it back on, it's just going to come up the same way. In addition, the major reason why it's immutable and read-only, and that that's the only place the application data partition where you can write, is because these devices are intended to just be hard powered off and powered on. People are just going to pull the plug. There's no on-off switch. There's, there's no graceful shutdown for these devices. You know, when you plug in something like a, a CD player, uh, wow, that's an older piece of technology to talk about. <laughs> it just powers on, and you just pull the plug, and everything's fine. They're usually pretty uh, solid state. The other nice thing about these systems is that they're lightweight. An average nerve system, uh, like the actual, this whole file system, the space that we take up on this SD card, it's about 25 megabytes. That's the entire Linux kernel, your app, everything that's needed to run it. Erlang runtime system, all of it. So why shouldn't this be that scary? Well, let's look at what connecting hardware would look like. Let's take a typical example. We have a Raspberry Pi, and we've got this water sensor, right? Because we want to know how much water there is. Uh, in this plant. And we're going to read from this water sensor, and if the water level is low, then we'll activate this sprinkler system. And the uncanny part about this is that this may look complex, and you're like, oh, water sensors. Like, I don't know what a water sensor does. Or there's a protocol that it uses that I'm a little, like, you know, I don't know what that is. And I've never hooked up wires before. But the, the funny thing about it is that this is almost no different than this. Sometimes we get lost when we think about size and a relevancy to our actual problems. Just because these computers are small and the sensors are small doesn't mean that they're going to act differently than a large-scale distributed web system. Most of the time, you can apply the same concepts to these devices. In this case, we have a server that's just hitting off of a weather API. It's an external service. If it's down, you know, just handle it differently. Like, wait. Like, try it again. Back off. You know, use all the same standard practices that you would for your web application. In this case, like, if your uh, weather sensor is unreadable for a minute, fine, back off. Just read it again later. Schedule that sprinkler system to be able to turn on from then. This is just a distributed system, just the same as this is a distributed system. The problems are the same. It's just on a larger scale. Now, the neat thing about this, when we think about those digital cities that we've created that we're all comfortable with working with, is that the things that we do inside of those, that digital realm, inside of the internet, standing up web services and such, all of those things are beneficial to us in that digital environment. But when we stand up and walk away from our laptops at the end of the day, there's still going to be a series of physical tasks that we have to deal with because we still have to live in this physical world. And so in my digital life, if I want to do something 
so that I can gain more time to do the things that I love. There's some mundane task that I keep having to do. I'll automate that mundane task out, and then I can have more time to be able to do the things that I want to do. But there's still this physical world that I have. And so NERVS gives you the capability, using the same tools that you're familiar with, and the same architecture and principles that you're also familiar with, to be able to take physical things like watering plants, model it as if you would a software problem, and apply it as an actual physical device. Over the last year, while preparing for some of the NERVS training classes, I kind of went a little hog wild with this around my house. And the first place I started was, I was like, you know, I like cold beer. So if I could automate my kegerator to be able to make sure that I can have just the right temperature, maybe even tell me like the weight of each one of my kegs with a touchscreen display on the front of it, that would be really cool. And then I went on further to be able to take these same devices and like integrate them into my office because I figured in the middle of the summer in the US there was a problem with getting fresh romaine lettuce this year. It was a E. coli scare. And I just wanted a salad. <laughs> so I built a hydroponic farm in my house. <laughs> There's a whole number of people that are out there that build these devices to be able to you know, make their lives a little bit better. Um, some of these pictures here, uh, we have uh, in the top middle, one of my favorite, that's the helicopter project. Somebody took a Raspberry Pi running nerves and they put it on a quadcopter. Um, I really enjoy that one a lot because I, I also try to fly quadcopters. I say try. There's three crashed ones on my wall. Uh, a nice example down on the bottom right, those are Lego EV3 bricks uh, running the same firmware on each one of them, um, but they uh, mesh together in an Erlang, distributed Erlang, using that to be able to determine who's responsible for sorting which color. And then they essentially just send like, the blocks down the line and then they'll color sort those. So they're all running the same firmware, but they know how to work with each other, right? And so just like that now, what does it mean to be production ready in this case? Now, to me, and the maker movement, and the toys and the devices that we have available to us to model our physical domain these days, production ready doesn't mean that I can go out and buy a product to be able to do these things. This redefines my way of thinking of production ready as to say, can I just fix this problem at my house by myself? So in this case, as we obviously think, when we put stuff into production, in like servers, we have some issues that we have to deal with. Like, how do we debug these devices? And one of them that comes to mind uh, with NERVS projects specifically, here's some tricks you can use to be able to debug some hardware. One of which is, uh, a problem with a logger. You know, I've seen a lot of, like, everybody's go-to. You, know, you do an IO inspect, IO puts, you do some logger output just to be able to get your hands on, like, where you are with things, and then you can start to put bigger and better tools in place if you wanted to. But the problem is that, uh, just like with a remote web server, the shell, uh, the, the console session that Erlang has is, like, enclosed into itself, right? So um, here I'm using the words host and target. Host is representing, like, your laptop and the target's representing like a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is running Erlang, and in running Erlang, it has a console session. But that console session you're almost never attached to, and you're almost always interacting with that device over some sort of remote connection, like SSH or Remshell. And so when it comes to logger messages, all the logger messages are only delivered to the console session. Here's an example you can run locally on your own. If I bring up two nodes, one node on the left and one node on the right, and they're both running the exact same code, and I hit a line that tells me to sh uh, throw a logger.debug message on node one, node two doesn't see that. And in some situations, this might be okay, but it's kind of problematic with NERVS devices because how are you supposed to see your log messages? So to get around this, we developed a, a package we call RingLogger, which is not NERVS specific, by the way. You can use this in any Elixir application. Uh, and RingLogger, what it does is it allows you to be able to attach to, the, to this ring log buffer that uh, is a custom logger backend. Uh, and then that ring log buffer then can uh, uh, send messages to attached console sessions. And the nice thing about uh, uh, attaching and like, being able to attach and detach and like, see these log messages as they go from a ring log buffer 
is that sometimes when you're connecting to nerves devices, your error that you encounter happens before your connection is established. So once you attach, you're only going to get new messages. And to fix that, we also have some commands and helpers in there that allow you to be able to say, what happened before I got here? And maybe I want to just be able to see what happened on the Ethernet port. Now, all of this is fine, well, and dandy, but the problem with nerves and showing you slides and explanations like this is that uh, building physical devices is a physical thing. So here I have a Raspberry Pi Zero. This is a really cool device. It's about 10 bucks. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. And you can run nerves on it. So let's see a demo. All right. To get started, it's pretty easy. You just have a few host tools to start. Uh, there's a getting started guide that I'll link you to at the end here. But essentially, you're just going to install a new project generator. And from there, we can say mix nerves.new. Uh, and we'll call it, I don't know, my app. And we're going to do a flag here called init gadget. Init gadget uh, is just a flag, the, a bunch of helper libraries to be able to get you up and running quickly with a nerves application. When we generate this project, it'll ask us if we want to install and fetch dependencies. Sure, why not? And then once we have this, because this always works as according to plan, we can CD into my project or my app. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, export, much like we would mix env, we're going to do mix target. Because now we're building mix uh, uh, applications in a multi target fashion, we're going to set mix target to Raspberry Pi Zero and make sure that we have all our dependencies. You'll see something that's a little bit different than you're not used to maybe, is that uh, at the end of fetching dependencies, we make sure that we download all of the pre-compiled assets for nerves that you might need. Take my SD card, and I'll put it in. I'll call mix firmware. I'm just going to call mix firmware.burn right away, which is going to create firmware. Uh, which compiles the application, cross-compiles it for, uh, for that target, uh, creates an OTP release, and then when it's finished creating an OTP release, it'll search for the SD card that's in my laptop uh, and uh, uh, expand the root file system that was created out onto that SD card. So it'll see, I found a memory card. Yes, let's use that. Let me type in my super secret password. And because my window is small, it's uh, screwing up the end curses a little bit, but you get the idea. And now I have an SD card. So the next thing I can do now is take my Raspberry Pi Zero, plug it into my computer. It'll start to do the blinky lights. And out of the box, the init gadget package, the reason that we added that flag is because the Raspberry Pi Zero has this uh, USB port on it uh, right here, the second one in, it's called the gadget port. And the cool thing about it is that it supplies the Raspberry Pi with power, but it also allows the Raspberry Pi to open up a virtual serial port and Ethernet connection back to your laptop, which means over here I can just, uh, oh, so, uh, it also runs uh, MDNS out of the box, so I can just say ssh uh, nerves.local, and I'm in my remote machine. So here you'll see that there's a little extra stuff. Uh, we can see that uh, we're on, uh, we can, we can uh, look at the ring logger messages by calling ring logger next. Um, that it, uh, scroll back through some of the messages where it formatted some of the file systems. It's got some Linux boot kernel messages here as well. Uh, and uh, we also have a whole bunch of other helper functions that were brought in with this helper library we wrote called, uh, uh, that Frank wrote called Toolshed uh, to do things like top if you wanted to be able to get a quick perspective on some of the things that are running on the system. Uh, and you can even quickly do command tasks by uh, see like what's in the proc directory. So we can definitely see uh, that we're on a Linux file system here. Sorry, it's a little blown out. And then when we're done, we can just type exit and our session's closed. So just like that, like start to finish getting up and running with the NERVS application, that was, that was deploying it locally. So now here's the problem. Well, we're going to go back to the days now of distributing devices. 
So does that mean that as we start distributing systems that our iteration time that we love so much is going to go down? Well, we looked at this problem and we realized that this is nothing more than the same sort of story of having a deployment problem. Like, how do you maintain a, a lot of distributed nodes that are out there? And our answer to this was to create a project called NervesHub. Now, NervesHub is something that we were launching this year to be able to uh, create a remote, uh, a, 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 like a, a served web application at nerves-hub.org uh, that uses Phoenix channels to be able to connect uh, to these Nerves devices, so that device on the, left, the right there. And as you have more devices that come online, uh, all of those devices can end up connecting to NervesHub. And the trick is, what you do is you just bottle these up in NervesHub, and you say, like, okay, here's a group. This is groups called prod. So if I want to deploy to prod, I can just, from my terminal, basically, just say uh, NervesHub firmware push, uh, publish, and uh, from there, it'll publish the firmware to the NervesHub server, and NervesHub over Phoenix channels will inevitably then test it to that, uh, uh, to that deployment group. Now, because we're responsible people, we, we don't want to just go right out of the gate to one specific place. Uh, NervesHub makes it possible then to be able to automate these uh, deployments through test groups and QA groups. Uh, we also offer the ability, since a lot of hardware development has to happen on hardware because you're dealing with low-level protocols or like other connected like, like hardware devices that you know, require you to basically go out of like the pin header here or something, something that you can't really like model too well on your computer. Uh, in that case, in the test groups, we're also offering an ability to run unit tests that can execute on hardware and give you results back. So now we have a distributed, uh, distribution system that allows us to be able to get the things that we wanted from what is production ready for web. We can do property testing and A-B testing, and it's more secure. So the biggest problem about IoT stuff is that you know, you put this device out there and it'll never get updated, and then eventually vulnerabilities are going to be found for it, and you're not going to patch them, and then it becomes less secure and less secure the longer it runs. Uh, and then, but if the more you can keep up with it and, the, and, the, and deploy to it, the more secure that that device can remain. So I want to share with you a little bit about now how we use this at Latote. So I'm, I work for Latote, and uh, we have a warehousing problem there. And our warehousing problem essentially is that we need to be able to track garments through their life cycle inside of our warehouse. And uh, to do that, it kind of required us to be able to think differently about what warehouse software was out on the market. So we decided that we would write our own stuff. And to be able to do that quickly, the very first thing that we did was we created sort of a kiosk terminal. And that terminal, all it would do to be able to maximize our resources, uh, i.e., when you make the interfaces and stuff that the, that the, the worker is going to interface with, we should write those in web software because we have a bunch of web developers available. And, uh, we'll let them build the interfaces. Uh, the hard lifting part was only to be able to, to connect to these devices because we needed to interface with barcode scanners and RFID scans and USB printers and stuff. So the way that we did it was uh, we, the, the Nerves app that ran on these computers, all it would do is it would have a series of Elixir-driven uh, 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 drivers, and those drivers would look for connected devices and when it found those connected devices, it would then uh, build a proxy for that device to proxy its I.O. through a Phoenix channel API, then giving the power to the front end that's being rendered from the web to say, not only will the front end make, establish a remote uh, channel connection to the server that uh, links up all of these devices that are out there, but it'll also establish one to the Phoenix channel server that's running on itself on localhost. And the local one was the, all the device hardware, and the remote one was all of the like, state and logic. And right at the browser level then, we're able to receive stuff from the local devices and then just send it out to the remote or do some processing on it, and it was easy. This gave us a scalability that we could just put these new devices out there, all with the same firmware, and all loading the remote content. The problem came though, uh, when we wanted to be able to, we wanted to be able to like do like A/B testing in this case, and you kind of can't because, or you can, but it's going to take a lot of sort of like finagling on the website to be able to try to identify what workstation you're on and then go different code paths for that. 
it, it, it felt a little hairy. So uh, to fix that, we decided that, uh, well, we can deploy this stuff now. Like we don't need to be, we don't need to render this stuff remotely anymore because now we have a better deployment strategy. We can use Nerves Hub to be able to deploy the actual running application instead of pulling the web code from the web, from the remote place, we can, we can burn it into the firmware and then we can do things like, you know what, that workstation I want to be able to run beta code. Let's put that, let's tag that workstation with the beta channel. So anytime now something passes from test to QA, it'll go into beta before it moves to production. And so this employee at this station will be testing code to make sure that it works uh, properly without like negative feedback uh, before we end up pushing it to the other ones. This was some, something that we could really do before because deployment to these devices was hard. Something else that it affected us was it allows us to be able to reduce our dependency for, for loading these applications from Phoenix. I mean, it's great. Hands down, it's great because we can take web developers and they don't have to know anything about embedded hardware and we can make them embedded developers just naturally because they, they're just writing web interfaces. They just happen to be running on an embedded device. And now in this case, we can say we can start peppering in things like Scenic so that we can uh, make the product even lighter weight so that it can deploy faster and uh, it can be even more resilient. And all of this was basically possible because we had a more appropriate deployment strategy for managing these devices in the field. And so if you want to learn more about some of these things, the best place to start would be on Hexdocs uh, for nerves. Uh, you can go to the uh, Getting Started Guide. It'll be the first thing to show up. That'll walk you through all of the requirements that you need to be able to install for your system to get up and running. To learn more about Nerves Hub, uh, well, right now it's in private beta still. Uh, but if you have a, uh, an organization that's interested in using it, uh, let us know. We'll definitely uh, sign you up so that we can start to get a lot of quality feedback. But we are looking for people to be able to help out with the project. It's a very, it's, it's all open source, uh, and uh, it's a, a very, uh, 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 I don't want to say complex, but it's an umbrella of like four or five different Phoenix applications that all work together to be able to do this entire system. Um, and uh, we definitely need people on the front end uh, because we're embedded engineers that don't do a lot of web programming on the front end. So uh, any help is great in that case. Um, and we tried to keep it as sort of vanilla as possible so that anybody who's interested in jumping in and helping should be able to feel comfortable that they don't have to learn some additional packaging. Uh, and uh, so yeah, you can check us out on uh, GitHub uh, at uh, nerves-hub. And with that then, I have to say, you know, once again, what does it really mean these days to be production ready? Because we've seen different kind of use cases, meaning different kind of things to different kind of people. And so therefore, when it comes to answering this question of whether or not you think that what you have is production ready, it really is up to you. If you're working on it, and it's up to you and it's up to the domain that you're working on. You know, if you're, if you're trying to be able to ship web software, then, then ship it 20, 30, 40 times a day. I mean, the more the better. Uh, and, and with the tools and power that we have with prototyping hardware, with Nerves and Nerves Hub, we're hoping to be able to get closer and closer to offering the same feeling and experience that you would be familiar with when it comes to developing web software. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, do we have any questions? Make sure they're production ready. Let's see. Oh, over there. Oh, hold on. Hi, thanks for the talk. It's uh, always nice to see some hardware. Um, one of the questions I have for you is how does the running something like a base Elixir system, an OTP system, uh, compare with, say, a compiled C or a standard embedded um, option for, or a more traditional option for running a software on an embedded device? Uh, great question. Uh, there's actually a place, a time and place for both, is really the answer. And um, uh, the, it, was, it was basically around whether or not you should run in C uh, or what the performance differences are. 
uh, or what the differences in general are before uh, between running uh, the Beam, the VM, uh, versus uh, straight C code for the stuff, or you know, I mean, even Python or something like that. Uh, and and really, the reason why I say uh, it depends uh, uh, on what you're doing is because uh, uh, C and C++ code is going to be able to run at a lot faster and lower rates. And sometimes you're going to have to satisfy real-time guarantees for uh, certain devices, in which case you're going to have to use something like an Arduino or a microcontroller to do that. But it doesn't mean that that's, that needs to be where uh, the story ends for you. Um, uh, OTP and Erlang are really good at supervising things. And if we consider that running device that's running C and C++ that's part of your system to be part of the distributed system itself, then you can let ner uh, Nerves and Erlang do what it does best, supervise it, make sure that it stays running. And so oftentimes you'll find that you'll need a blended approach. Um, and, uh, but the happy path usually is that if you can do it in, er in Elixir, uh, you kind of want to stay in that as much as you can. But, but oftentimes you'll see that there's some like helper libraries out there for certain devices and other sensors and stuff and stuff uh, that may just be interesting to bring in. And in that case, you could even do that as a port or a NIF. Uh, any other oh, OK. So uh, first, thank you. I have a Raspberry Pi that I bought for Nerves a couple of weeks ago. This was a great introduction. Um, and related to that, uh, you said you went a bit hog wild with things in your house. So if you lose electricity, what's the failover? Like, uh, do you remember what you're supposed to do if all this, all this automation goes away? Yeah, yeah. Good question, too. Uh, well, so, for example, my uh, uh, hydroponic farm. Uh, when it comes up and running, it, it, it'll do some, you're, you're in charge of the initialization sequence. And if the power goes out on it, I mean, the data partition may become corrupt, but then you just make sure, it just kind of factory resets. Um, and uh, in that case, I have preloaded the, the read-only part of the firmware to include the sort of default standards that I want on like how often I want the light cycle to time on and off. And so we've had situations where we've lost power and uh, the thing just comes back alive and continues to work. Um, uh, actually, it's, it's pretty funny. Uh, there's a, uh, I don't know if anybody knows uh, Wendy Smoak. Uh, she, um, in the early days of NERVS, built a cat feeder to feed her cats with. took all the fun out of working with hardware because the thing just keeps working. <laughs> and and I, can, I can claim the same sort of feelings of success in that case of dealing with uh, things like uh, uh, programming in C and, and just programming in Python for just getting things up and running. Um, the big, huge benefit of running under Erlang is the supervision portion and maintaining its resiliency. And so when things come back, they just seem to come back and just keep working. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask, are you able to, to, to talk about the, uh, how Nerves Hub has been adopted and received since the private beta? Sure, yeah. Uh, so right now, uh, we have Latote fully onboarded with Nerves Hub. Uh, we manage about 50 or so devices for connections there. Um, and uh, I've been really happy with using it. It's been real, a, a, a true joy to be able to use, to be able to push the device uh, firmware down uh, to these uh, uh, workstations um, and managing them that way. Uh, I'm in the process of rolling over uh, the NERVS project. We have an automated test server uh, that we run. So anytime we push code that affects any of the standard systems or tool chains, uh, we execute that against real hardware to make sure that it boots and doesn't break so that it doesn't go out the door without, uh, that won't affect like uh, users. And we also collect feedback, too, to be able to say, like, you know, from people in the community, like, if they build a custom nerve system that does some custom things and we're aware of it and, and people are using it, we'll, we'll include it in our test farm uh, to make sure that when we make up, like, changes that we don't break them as well. Um, we're also in the process of onboarding uh, uh, FarmBot uh, onto NerveSub, and they've included their own sort of set of challenges. Uh, for example, a FarmBot robot is an outdoor farming robot that waters and weeds and plants and does everything for you. Uh, and it like kind of mounts onto a raised bed, and it's like a like a, a an elaborate CNC machine, uh, and uh, and those don't necessarily always have an active internet connection, 
And so the question was like, how do I maintain an application for like a phone that when it goes into service can see that there's a firmware update and then go over to the device and then apply it from the phone as like a third party? And so the adoption there has just been a little slower because we needed to write a little bit more to be able to bring that in, but uh, that's getting closer and closer. And then uh, uh, Frank, the co other co-author, he's the uh, company is SmartRent, and they're building these uh, smart home devices uh, that uh, are going to be uh, also leveraging connectivity to other services like Amazon IoT. Um, and when uh, looking at their structures, we had to do a little bit of redesign to the way that we run our certificate authority for NervSub to secure all of the communication so that we can uh, mimic the same models and make sure that uh, you only have to generate one set of private information to store on the device that can then be used to connect you to all of these different services that you might need. So, so far, uh, more and more companies are coming up to production on NervSub, uh, but it's just taking a little time to be able to uh, onboard some of them uh, because some, some take require, uh, requirements on changing uh, the behavior of delivering firmware and then others take uh, requirements on changing sort of the hardware that's associated with securing uh, the devices themselves. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> All right, um, that's it. Everybody uh, give a round of applause to Justin. Thank you.